need to press any yeah. buttons, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> and we've all got our fingers and toes and everything crossed. OK, can I reconvene uh, this meeting after that unfortunate uh, suspension? Um, Mary, you were um, quest doing the questions on uh, housing options. Yes. And I think David was answering Yes, we were talking about support for um, people leaving prison. Yes. Yeah. About to. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was about to say that um, within the hubs, a good example is is looking at um, what happens when people are coming out of prison. Um, but actually, beyond that, what we're looking at in our hub is what happens when people go into prison, um, and and taking a very close look at, at how we can be more effective at supporting and advising people as they go into the prison estate to actually um, prevent homelessness when they then leave the prison estate. And that, that's a piece of work. It's one of the themes that we're looking at in the West Hub, and it's tied into a bit of work that um, is happening at a national level, and one of our colleagues in that hub is representing us on that national group. Um, I think one of the things, I had a bit of a chat with Janine at the break, um, one of the issues that probably taxes us most is the, the numbers of people who are in homelessness and actually staying in temporary accommodation who then go back into prison. Um, and it's usually, you know, short-term sentences. Um, they go in for a few weeks and, and then come back out and present again. And we need to find much better ways and, and work on um, the best means of supporting those individuals as they go through that process. I think what's quite clear is that for people who are in prison for long term, um, the services that wrap around those individuals when they're coming out are generally of a pretty high standard. I think it is the issue about people who are in for very short stretches of time in prison. Um, and, of course, they, they, they lose the momentum that they might have gained because we've done maybe a lot of work with people to resettle them, to get them ready through support to move into the community. And then they, they go back and get sentenced again. So you, you're absolutely right. That is an area that we need to focus more effectively on. But I think the opportunity that we've been given through the hub arrangement is enabling us to do that in a way we couldn't have done it before. Is that something that could be rolled out across all the hubs? Yes. And the opportunity that we have, because periodically all of the hubs come together mm. in, in a single meeting, is that's a really good opportunity to share the practice that's developing mm -hmm. across the okay. other hubs. That's really interesting. Does anyone else want to comment on that specific I issue? Can, can or, or at least give committee some information on the national project that was referred to there. It's the um, Ministerial Group on Offender Reintegration. Uh, and it's looking at a, a whole range of services for prisoners, but housing is one of them. Uh, and I believe it's Perth Prison that's being used as a pilot project for it. And that'll be where your colleagues from the Perth and Kinross hub, just for your information. OK, that's very interesting. Thank you very much for that. Did you want to come in on something, more? I can do my next question. No, on you go. Right, OK. Um, can we move on to, to talk a bit more about um, young people? Because both this committee and the Equal Opportunities Committee has heard evidence to suggest that housing options is not always the, the best way to, to deal with, with young people and it doesn't always give the, the best outcome for them. So what specifically are the, the problems that local authorities and RSLs face in dealing with young people who quite often have quite complex um, needs and circumstances when they become homeless or are in a position where they need support. Um, it could be through the leaving care or um, quite often young people leave home for a number of reasons, whether it's family breakdown, drug or alcohol misuse. Um, and I'd also be interested in your thoughts on young people and this definition around intentionality and what effect intentionality has on supporting young people who are homeless. I um, begin on that as well. Um, my microphone doing things. The, um, one of the things I think that has gone wrong today is that the people from the Housing Options Hubs didn't turn up this morning for your informal briefing session. And um, I'm sorry about that because it would have helped, I think, to allow the committee a really good understanding of how the housing options hubs work. 
Now, I think there are five of them. They all are a bit different. Um, their practice is different. They're bringing together a practice of the 32 local authorities. And some of them are further ahead than others. Um, but I know that in the hub, certainly in Tayside, you know, there is a focus on helping young people and there are people who are expert in that particular role. And by coming to the Housing Options Hub, by the, the Housing Options Service, um, you should actually get plugged into the other services that you need. So a young person turning up um, for a Housing Options interview should um, be directed, if you like, to the Social Work Service or the Community Work Service or whoever it is that they require to, to, to help them and provide the support that they require. The, um, and there's the housing support duty as well, which is written into legislation. So uh, it does, I think that's probably not right to say that the housing options isn't the best approach for helping young people. It's one way into the services. If they're leaving care, then they should be um, under the corporate parent of the local authority. And the local authority should therefore be providing support and there should probably be somebody with them when they're seeking advice about housing. Um, in fact, arguably, if they're leaving care, they shouldn't be anywhere near the homelessness system because um, they're not homeless. They're simply moving into the next stage of their lives. Um, and if they are getting into the homelessness system, then something's gone wrong. I know that some local authorities do it that way, but I don't think it's a particularly good way to do it. Um, so the housing options approach ought to fit young people as any other group in society. And um, I know that Janine could probably provide some more information about the way that housing options hubs work, which might replace some of what you would have heard this morning had, had they turned up. My concern is um, the reality of what should happen isn't what, what you've expressed, because we have heard that people leaving care, young people leaving care, do end up homeless. They shouldn't, but, but they, they do. And there's not that continuum of you leave care and then you, you move into your own house and, and all the support is there. And while there may be areas where it is, it's best, best practice and you are plugged into all the support, I think it's, it's too, the evidence we've heard is it's too fragmented. And there, need, there does need to be improvements made in that. So it is, it's an automatic thing. It's not if you're in one local authority, it happens. If you're in another local authority, it doesn't. Because young people are being... They are falling through that, that safety net. Housing options is obviously about far more than housing options. Housing options, as I said previously, is about taking that holistic look at the needs of an individual. And I think it probably better serves young people more than it serves anyone else because of the access to services it gives them, irrespective of whether they're young people coming through care or another, or a young person coming from the family home. Because one of the first things we're looking at is what is the best interim arrangement for this young person? And I think we now recognise in local authorities that for all young people, the last thing we want is for them to be sitting within homeless accommodation. It makes them more vulnerable than they already are. So the point of a young person approaching is, in fact, even prior to approach, we're trying to do quite a lot of work around about getting the message out to young people about the realities of homeless and homelessness and how they access housing services. But what we're also doing at the point of approach is we're looking at what the what the presenting issues of that young person are, and we're determining first off as to whether or not that best person, that young person, will be best placed back within the family home. And if that's the case, we're looking at things like mediation services, family support services to ensure that we can keep young people at home, to try and ensure that they don't become more vulnerable and get them onto the appropriate housing waiting lists. But what we're also recognising is where young people can't stay at home, and there are a number of young people who just can't, you know, because of the, the circumstances within the family home, that we need to look at different models of accommodation for them because we need to ensure that we speed up processes as quickly as possible so that their life isn't unsettled. And again, that's where housing options comes in because it's ensuring that we're looking at things like employability, we're looking at their not just their financial resources, but their social resources, the equity that's out there for them, where they've got their support networks, where they're linked in, whether it's extended family or friends who can provide the assistance that they require to help them continue to develop within their lives rather than stand still. And that's what House and Options does. It, it carries out the assessment, a far wider assessment than was ever carried out before, and it links people in with services. 
I do pick up your point about care leavers and the fact that there, there is different practice across the country. But for a number of years now in the local authority for which I work, young uh, care leavers haven't gone through the homelessness route. And that's because we are working with young people whilst they're in care. And we're doing that house and options work at that point. Because what we recognise is even though young people are in, are in care, they still have an element of social equity within certain of our certain communities. And we're trying to link them in with housing in those communities so that we can ensure that they're, again, they're not vulnerable and that they can be successful into their adult lives. Anyone else? No? Okay. Um, can, I, can I point out... I think you're absolutely right to allude to the additional challenges for young people. There, there are a range of new challenges, um, some of which have come about through welfare reforms that affect the options that might be available to young people. And we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't shy away from that. That has created additional difficulties. Um, it's, you know, I suppose what we're trying to do within the hub networks and, and through the sharing of good practice is talk to each other about, well, what have you tried in your area that's worked um, and can we replicate that or can we look at something similar in our own area? Notwithstanding the fact that you can't just translate something that's worked in one place and, and ensure that it will work everywhere. But we are looking at things like flat sharing options as long as they're supported, because there's a good recognition that young people, one of the reasons why a lot of, a lot of tenancies fail for young people is really just because they feel so isolated. So we're looking at different types of support that are tailored. We in, in North Lanarkshire have Bernardo's delivering housing support to our young people when they move on um, and they actually go into our children's houses and do pre-work with young people. Um, so th those kinds of um, services are available out there. You can't overlook the fact, though, that even having gone through that process, some young people will fail. And I think the difference is now that, you know, they can come back into services and they can come back to us and say, it didn't work out for whatever reason. Um, and, and we can go on giving them services until it does work out. And I think that, 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 that has been a real change over the last 10 or so years in terms of how local authorities and their partners respond to young people. But the, there are huge challenges and the challenges may increase for young people. Some of the options that you can offer people of uh, you know, older age people, um, adults, you can't offer young people because they're just not going to be suitable for them. And for that reason, and the shape of the stock that might be available in an area just doesn't necessarily suit. So we do need to do more to ensure that young people can be supported to sustain a home. It doesn't need to be a, a local authority home. It could be in the private rented sector. I think the issue is about ensuring that there's a bit of support to go, to go along with whatever offer of accommodation they get. Mm. Yes, to me. Add something there. Um, Clearly, we've got a big challenge coming up. We're hearing from the Conservative Party conference that there might be a proposal to stop housing benefit for 18 to 21-year-olds. Um, I urge the Conservatives to think that proposal through very carefully, as it could have some very difficult, unintended consequences for people who are in the situation that um, you describe, and young people who are um, homeless, homeless or at risk of homelessness. Um, another thing, I think, which... Um, is worth pointing out is that young people who have had no contact with the social work department who fall out of their families in one way or another um, are actually very hard to, to help because the social work department and you know, the council in general has no background on them and doesn't really know much about them and they might not know very much about the, the council and the services it can provide. One of the presentations we've had at the Homelessness Prevention Strategy Group was from Shelter Safe and Sound Project, which is based in Dundee, as it happens. But um, the, it's a, a concept which they hope to roll out much more widely. And they seem to be very good at plugging young people into the services which are available. Another thing is that this is skilled work at the housing options hubs. Now, the Scottish Housing Regulator, and I know you've already heard from the regulator, pointed out that not all the hubs are as effective as each other, it's still early days, um, everyone's still learning, best practice is still being shared. But um, I can imagine as a young person going in and um, 
Janine telling me, I, I, we'd like to get you back to your family, and maybe panicking and thinking, I'm not going back there to the family where I've been abused or where I've just fallen out with them completely, and then going away and telling all their friends that, um, no, all they want me to do is go back home, they're no use. Um, and that would be a complete misconception because actually what Janine has said is, is the, the, the reality. Um, that is the intention, is that a range of services will be provided and we'll try and find a solution for that young person. So the way that we communicate with the people who use our services, whether they're young, middle-aged or old, um, is really important. They have to... It's quite a complicated thing, the whole homelessness and housing situation. It's like understanding a whole new market. Um, the housing market in any city or in any part of the country is complicated. And unless you've been exposed to it before, you don't necessarily understand it easily. And I think that as when you go to the doctor, um, you forget half of what you're told. Uh, when you go to any kind of council service, there's a risk that you will forget half of what you were told and um, go away with, uh, with a misconception. So that people go away not realising that they're entitled to temporary accommodation um, and not realising that if they are entitled to it, there is usually a way of paying for it. So it, I think it, the way that we communicate to the people who come to our service is hugely important. And personally, I would write things down so that they can go away and look at it later and remember what they've been told. These are simple, basic things, but I think there's, there's good practice which we have to spread out and the national guidelines that are coming for housing options, I think, will be helpful. Um, I think that it's, that's why we support their introduction. Um, so it was a bit of a ramble, but get, getting back to the young people, um, I think absolutely it's really important that we get this right. And um, I think that if you are aware of examples of poor practice, it would be very helpful if you drew them to the attention of your local authority, um, because I, I think they would want to respond to that. Continuing to share good practice and the national guidelines are enough to improve the, the, the practice, or is there something else that practically could be done to make things better for young people? I think we need to survey our customers. Um, we need to do the market research. In other words, we need to find out from people who have used our services how they found the experience. And um, I think Janine has something to say about that, about the way that we're trying to involve service users in... Um, in quality control, if you like. I think organisations like Shelter have a, a role to play as well. Um, I used to work for Shelter years and years ago, and one of the things that we used to do was force local authorities to do their job um, by threatening to take them to court or by actually taking them to court. Now, I'm hoping that those days are over because I think local authorities have a much better attitude to homelessness. It's, it's now accepted that providing a good homelessness service is part of the culture part of our duties in local authorities, and I'm not aware of any local authority that's kicking against that. But um, having said that, it's good if there's external scrutiny so that if somebody is coming to shelter and saying, I had a bad experience in shelter, and then sharing that with us and helping us work through it, then I think we can improve things that way. So it's a matter of us understanding the experience our customers are getting but a wee bit of external prodding from agencies like Shelter or the Citizens Advice Agency does us no harm. Within the health um, service user involvement consultation is something that we're looking at. Uh, within the West Hub that I represent, we, are, we have developed a service user involvement empowerment framework. And that's... It's, it, it's moving away from the old filling out a questionnaire to try and test what people think about our services to ensuring that our customers are integrated into how our services are developing. So that means that we're trying to collect the customer voice throughout the journey and taking that a stage further and developing them into, into a group that can actually be consulted when we're looking at developing policy, procedure and strategy. Within the West Hub, we have just recently undertaken our first peer review of one other local authority and that was really, really interesting because that's about developing good practice and sharing good practice. But what we did was we used that service user group to go out and undertake the mystery shopping and the learning that came from, from that was probably the most powerful part of the peer review. Okay. Thank you. Gavin? The, the national monitoring framework, which is so obviously developing, will also have a, a role here to, to play in terms of identifying trends, identifying where there are uh, authorities that are outlying in terms of parts of the performance. And there's also the developing uh, agenda on benchmarking, which should uh, uh, focus in on where there are 
uh, differences in, in performance that should be reviewed and uh, with a view to improvement. So I think there is a, a developing framework there that should support the spread of, of best, best practice. Okay, I think we need to move on. Oh, sorry, it's okay, quickly. I just wanted to add, this. in addition, as a formal structure for the good practice sharing, there's the annual conference which brings together the hubs, and that's been regularly um, ongoing. And it's always a, a, you know, a very intensive day with, 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 with strong commitment from, from, from all the actors, including the, the political side. Um, so so that, that offers a formal um, framework, plus, of course, the Homeless Prevention Strategy Group, which brings together you know, at a fairly high level, um, <coughs> COSLA, everybody around the table here um, has, has dealt with individual cases which were presented where, where, where there were concerns being raised and they have then been taken quite quickly up to the to, 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 to COSO's executive group which brings together all the elected members from the 32 authorities. So there is a structure of moving up any concerns really quite rapidly and <coughs> a formal structure for the good practice sharing. Okay, you finished? All right. Gordon? Uh, I want to ask about the effects of welfare reform on the duty to provide settled accommodation for all unintentional homeless households. And reading through the, the written evidence, uh, I was taken by the statement from uh, Alacho, which said, a difficult task at the best of times, made all the more challenging by the worst recession since the 30s and some of the most regressive welfare reforms ever enacted. So uh, I'm keen to hear... How has the diversion of resources to mitigate welfare reform impacted your ability to implement the homeless legislation? Um, get, getting the settled accommodation isn't quite as hard as getting the temporary accommodation, but um, maybe, Julie, would you want to, to, to answer that? There is actually a correlation between the two because there are people who um, are staying longer in temporary accommodation because previously we used to be able to offer them accommodation perhaps with an extra bedroom um, and people now are saying, I can't take that offer. Or, um, and it's not only people who are currently unemployed, but it might be people who uh, lack security and employment and fear that in the future they may not be in a position to actually pay for that extra bedroom. So it has had a, a, an impact in both areas. People are now saying, I can't take that choice, and that might be the only option that's available to me in that area, therefore I'll need to stay in temporary accommodation. Mm -hmm. the, the, the recent um, change in terms of the, the sort of full mitigation that's been offered by the Scottish Government um, has certainly assisted. However, the guarantee of that is only for this financial year. And whilst we, um, we hope that there's a, a guarantee for the future as well, um, people are still a bit reluctant to count on that just yet. You mentioned about uh, temporary accommodation, but is the supply of temporary accommodation, is that growing or is it restricting? I mean, if you're saying people are staying longer in temporary accommodation, is, is there the amount of temporary accommodation there to cope with the problem? Um, I think there's, there's a couple of difficulties with temporary accommodation too. One is that in some areas, um, for example, in my own area, we didn't, um, di we didn't divest ourselves of available stock for temporary accommodation because we recognised we needed to keep it because although there were fewer numbers presenting, there was a higher proportion of people presenting who were actually taking up the offer of temporary accommodation. So I think at the moment it's around 85% of everybody that presents to us needs that temporary accommodation and they need it for longer. So we held on to our supplies. Um, the, 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 the next difficulty relates to how in future we're going to fund temporary accommodation because of the, the sort of caps and thresholds and changes to how that's funded as universal credit is rolled out. And we did a specific piece of work, actually. Alacho did a piece of work um, in conjunction with the um, Homelessness Prevention Strategy Group um, to look at what the real impacts on revenue would be for councils and uh, you know through a very sort of detailed process of building up the evidence as to what it actually costs to provide temporary accommodation 
um, we conclude that there will be a shortfall of around £25 million pounds minimum to actually fund temporary accommodation in the future. So, you know, we have that, um, uh, the, the sort of um, conflict that is potentially going to arise in future, and local authorities around the country are, are currently trying to plan for that, and it's been quite difficult to do that, you know, to balance, uh, you know, how are we in future going to balance the books, especially around um, the continued drive to have good quality temporary accommodation you know, that has all the facilities that people require, but at the same time that there's the ongoing um, issues around making efficiencies and and the squeeze, the real squeeze that's likely to come around as a consequence of welfare reforms. You, you talked about the £25 million pound shortfall that you've identified to fund temporary accommodation. If the proposal that Councillor Black talked about earlier on about the possible removal of housing benefit for 18 to 21 year olds came about, what impact would that have, especially on young families? Uh, it doesn't bear thinking about in terms of the impact, because you know, we just need to look at the shift in the, the profile, the characteristics of people who are now in the homelessness situation, especially those that are staying in accommodation. And they are of, of the younger age group that tend to be um, increasingly younger um, working age households, um, a lot of them under 35, um, including quite a lot under 21, uh, or uh, rather under 25. And uh, there is a huge potential here um, to create homelessness in Scotland in a way that we've not seen for a number of years. Um, you know, the, the, there is a limit to how much um, local authorities and their partners can support individuals who don't have any income. Um, a good example of that in recent months has been the rise in, in the numbers of particularly young and vulnerable people who have been sanctioned um, and the impact that that has on their ability to retain their status in their family. Um, a lot of families are fragmenting, not because um, they don't want to pull together, but because, frankly, the, the impact of the reductions in income in family households creates additional strains, and some families are really just struggling to cope with that. Um, what I'm not sure about, because the announcement was only made a couple of days ago and we don't have any of the details, um, I suppose you would want, one would want to assume that there would be safeguards for, for young people under the age of 25 who have children, for example, and safeguards perhaps for young people of that age that have come out of care. Um, but until we see the details, it's going to be difficult to know. If it was just a blanket policy that anybody of that age group wasn't entitled to housing benefit, it would have a huge significant impact because what about the people who are currently in homes, settled homes in their communities that would potentially be affected by that. So um, until we see the detail, it's difficult to work out, but it, it sounds as though it would have a dev devastating impact in Scotland. Or numbers of um, housing benefit claimants aged between 18 and 21 without children, uh, and it's nearly 7,000 in Scotland. And, and presumably a, number, a, a decent proportion of those would be in work in low paid work uh, it's again just to we don't always hear that sort of it's a sense of uh, in work or out of work uh, and of course uh, I think nationally the figure I don't know about younger people but certainly nationally I think there's a figure of almost 50 percent of people on 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 housing benefit are actually in, in work so okay we've kind of moved on to temporary accommodation so Mark you had some questions around that anyway we'll take those just now yep thank you Camilla. just to ask um how local authorities use of temporary accommodation has changed um, or if it has changed at all since the abolition of, abolition of priority need um, and the expansion of the housing options approach? Earlier, um, the majority of local authorities' stock profile has stayed the same. But what's been discussed within hubs at the moment and what seems to be happening is that local authorities are recognising that we need to change how we are delivering temporary accommodation and the support mechanisms that go into that temporary accommodation. And that's because we're, we're actually responding to a different client group that we did 10 years ago. 
What we are finding is that the clients that we have now are far more complex than they ever were before. They have got far higher levels of addiction issues, mental health issues, high level support needs. And some of the models of accommodation that we have don't necessarily meet their needs. We have to balance that with the resources that we have um, and obviously the, the impact that welfare reform is going to have on that. But the, the, there's a high proportion of local authorities who are currently looking at models of temporary accommodation. Yes, Gavin. Linked issue to this is, is obviously one means of relieving the, the pressure on, on temporary accommodation is, is obviously to increase the supply of good quality, uh, affordable housing for, for rent, and uh, so the councils are, are doing their utmost, working with housing associations to, to increase that supply. And within my own authority, we have a, a plan to build uh, 1,150 new homes by 2020, uh, and that programme is making good progress. So that uh, is, a, I think, an important factor that will link in with the, the development of uh, uh, temporary accommodation and, and relieve the pressure on that. Uh, and as we've seen just now. We're seeing people stay longer in temporary accommodation because of, as, as we've heard, the uh, impact of welfare reform and limiting uh, choices, but also the limited supply of uh, good quality, affordable housing. Yes, can I just touch a wee bit on the, the sort of remodelling? <clears throat> um, you're absolutely right to allude to that. There, there, there is a sense, and Janine's touched on it too, that because the client group has changed the profile of people that are now staying in accommodation has changed. Um, but what we need to ensure and guard against is a rush to um, create large-scale hostels again, which in Scotland we've um, been very successful in getting rid of, certainly in Glasgow, but even in my own area. Um, we took steps to, to really remove large-scale concentrations, especially when you've got people with very complex needs. That's the last thing we would want. However, the welfare reforms that are coming down the line um, appear to be pushing us in that direction again. And, and it would be, uh, given the balance between you know, having to provide services and the huge constraints um, and pressures on, on the available resources, it would be quite tempting for some councils to say, well, let's just go back to having you know, these big hostile environments uh, where we can somehow we can find a way to manage financially. Um, it would be extremely damaging to go back to that, and we, and we must, within Scotland, resist um, any pressure to do that and find other ways, more innovative ways of managing um, with, the, with the stock and the resources we've got. Um, add that I think even if um, there's no money at all to pay for um, temporary accommodation, and somebody will correct me if I'm wrong, we still have a duty to provide it. Um, we have to provide accommodation that is practical for someone to live in. And um, that gives local authorities a big dilemma in the future. If, if we're being faced with people who are homeless, who have absolutely no income whatsoever, no way of paying for the service that we're going to give them, um, how do we pay for that? So that's one thing. The second thing is that the, a lot of the money which we bring in through the rents that we charge for temporary accommodation uh, goes on staff. And for example, we have a unit in Dundee which is 24 hour supervision because the people in that particular um, tenement, it's a tenement, but you know, it's, it's got people who have fairly high support needs require that 24 hour supervision and support. And um, it's difficult to pay for that kind of thing if the amount of money available to pay for the temporary accommodation decreases. But that brings other problems because then, um, you know, Maybe you can't put these people into that accommodation, and then what do you do with them? So that's another problem. The other thing is the quality of temporary accommodation. We've worked really, really hard to bring the quality of temporary accommodation up to a very high standard. But if you take away the income which pays for it through welfare reform or any other means, um, then it, it makes it more difficult to maintain that high standard of temporary accommodation. But there are things that we can do um, to move forward, be a bit more imaginative. Sometimes, in some authorities, the temporary accommodation is one size fits all. You know, it's maybe all furnished vented accommodation. Actually, that doesn't always suit people who have some furniture or who can't afford to pay the high rent that furnished accommodation attracts. Um, I think we need to be flexible about the kind of accommodation that we provide so that it fits the families. 
And the other thing is we have to look at the length of time that people are spending in temp temporary accommodation. Six months is not untypical. A year is um, sadly quite common as well. And ask ourselves, does that really make any sense? And maybe there's a better way of doing that. Um, I don't have the better way, but I think as a politician, I get to ask the question. My colleagues here get to provide the answers. Okay, Mark. Um, remaining the same, but the, in the Scottish Housing Regulators report, um, they found that some local authorities had reduced the provision of their own properties for temporary accommodation. Um, just to ask the panel uh, how, wide, how widespread that is in terms of the 32 local authorities and how that will then impact on their ability to then provide um, temporary emergency accommodation. Differ across the 32 local authorities depending on the reducing levels of homelessness. In North Ayrshire, we were one of the first local authorities to start reducing homelessness, and that was because we were one of the first authorities to embrace housing options. So we went from 1,800 homeless presentations a year down to 700 and something temporary uh, presentations a year, but we only reduced our temporary accommodation units by 40. So we, we ensured that we had left enough leeway within our temporary accommodation. Firstly, it was because we didn't know if things might switch back. We didn't know if this was going to be an onward trend and it was, we were going to continue with those reducing levels or whether or not we would need that accommodation again. But what we've actually, we've been, we were glad that that was the decision that we'd taken because of the, the impacts that Julie's already spoken about and that we now need that because we need it for more of the clients who actually require the accommodation and they're there for a slightly longer period of time. Okay. Finally, we touched about touched on different models of, of temporary accommodation and ones that are pretty undesirable and um, I think you're right would be disastrous but in particular um, would you say there a, is there a particular problem with young homeless people and their experience of temporary accommodation and are there are there any alternative models out there that you think would work and would, that Scotland would benefit from their introduction? Range. Around the country, there will be a range at local level um, to meet different types of needs, and that's as it should be. And it's the same. Um, it, housing markets vary around the country, and, and that's what you would expect. Um, I think over the last few years, we have developed more um, environments that are more conducive to young, vulnerable people. M most In most local authority areas, they have one or more um, smaller supported accommodation places for young people. Um, we've also moved away um, from necessarily having um, people put in a concentrated place to having um, more float and support services. So a lot of us commission float and support services from um, you know, expert specialists in the field to support young people when they're accommodated in their own communities. So that there is there is a, a really good mix, I think, of approaches, and and you'll have varying degrees of success with each of them depending on local circumstances. Um, the, there is there is a definite um, push to shift. We definitely need more intensively supported accommodation, and we need it in small um, environments rather than large scale environments. And that's something that we've maybe not quite managed to get to. Um, we usually have a, a, a selection of different types of um, accommodation environments, some of which suit young people more than others, but probably we need more of that. And we recognise in our own local authority, we've got a temporary accommodation strategy. We refresh it annually. We look at all of the different um, factors that affect it on an annual basis. And we're just about to go through a process of re renewing it again and that's because we recognise that the client group that are using it has changed and that the complexity of need that a lot of people bring when they when they make homelessness applications has changed as well. How we're going to fund all of that um, remains a, a, a perennial challenge. It'll always be a challenge for us. Okay. Jim, you have... uh, thank you Thank you for your patience as well this morning. Um, I've got a question for Solace, um, although for other 
witnesses want to come in in the back of that, I'd, be, I'd welcome their contributions. Um, you say in your submission, or rather you, you recognise the Scottish Housing Regulator's position that all potentially homeless households receiving housing options should also make a homeless application. However, you state, and I quote, many local authorities suggest taking homeless applications from people who do not need them is neither a cost-effective use of local resources nor is it necessarily in the best interests of households who neither want nor need to be identified as homeless or potentially homeless. I'm just wondering what the thinking was behind that statement. Are you, are you um, looking towards changes to the reporting system for homelessness applications or other ways in which you think we should measure the risk and incidence of homelessness? Through you, Chair, it's really the rationale behind that is it would really be reverting back to uh, a mechanistic approach to you know, you know, the statutory uh, process of uh, assessing and determining homelessness rather than looking at each case uh, on its merits and uh, through the housing options approach providing you know, a full range of preventative measures and support. Um, so uh, I think it is, it's, it's reverting back to uh, a system that I think everybody recognised uh, was, was not working as well as it could. And, uh, but in saying that, it is important that there is uh, an effective system of monitoring and reporting on outcomes and the introduction of the framework uh, following the regulator's report. I think is a, a positive step uh, towards providing the type of information that should provide assurance to councils, to partners, to service users that the, the, the system is working and pr producing better outcomes rather than going through a mechanistic approach of uh, simply re recording applications, uh, basically for, for, for the sake of it. So, so you, are you saying that you're against the recording of applications per se, or simply that that shouldn't we're, we're be? We're stating that, that, that not every. We're, we're stating that not every uh, case should require a, a homeless application. When some, somebody comes uh, looking for assistance and support, the first priority is to provide that assistance and support, rather than going down the route of a, an application being a. a uh, completed. But isn't there a danger then that you underreport the uh, incidence or risk of homelessness? No, uh, as I mentioned, that, that should be uh, covered through the, the framework and the information that will be produced through that framework and understand the first reports from that should be uh, available uh, in, in, in the not too distant future. So that the information should provide assurance, as I said, to, to councils, to service users, to partners that the, the system is working and delivering uh, better outcomes. And we're not uh, in the, the business of trying to suppress uh, demand or uh, present uh, figures which uh, are not accurate. Is that view shared by all of the witnesses? I send people to housing options interviews when they come to see me at my surgery who are not homeless and nowhere near being homeless. There are people who, um, whose current housing arrangements are not suitable, but, but they're not homeless by any stretch of the imagination. If you then, if they then had a homelessness assessment completed for them, it would just completely skew the figures. And it would also mean that we would only be able to send people who were homeless or threatened with homelessness for a housing options interview. Housing options is meant to be preventative, so therefore you have to get in before um, people actually become homeless or threatened with homelessness. Um, I, I think there's a danger, actually, that would distort the whole thing. What I would say, though, is that anyone who comes and says that they want to apply as homeless, even if um, the person on the other side of the desk doesn't think they are, if they want to apply as homeless and fill out a form and be assessed, then I think they should have that right. Um, absolutely. But um, you would change the nature of housing options if you insisted that everybody who went through a housing options interview had to fill out a homelessness form. Actually, it would be absurd. So, so do we have a consensus across the panel? Is there anyone? Homelessness is considered as part of housing options. And it has to be presented to every person that approaches us for housing options advice. So people clearly understand that they've got the right to make that homeless presentation. But people choose not to. It's not about local authorities deliberately steering people away from homelessness. There is no concern about taking that homeless presentation if that's what the customer chooses. I would just add also um, that I, I don't see why there needs to be any conflict. Um, I think the regulator alluded to the 
Prevention of Homelessness Guidance that was produced jointly by COSLA and the Scottish Government in 2009, where it was very clearly laid out in that guidance that there doesn't need to be a conflict. A housing options interview is just, um, a, if you like, a complementary advice service to the homelessness system. There's, the homelessness system hasn't gone away. It still sits there. The services that are provided are still there. Um, the, the housing options approach is just a much broader, um, more um, diagnostic approach to ensuring that we can deal with whatever issues an individual might present to us, including the option of going through the formalised process of completing a homelessness application. That it doesn't need to be one or the other. It can be both. And, and I think that's something that, within the developing guidance, we would want to reinforce um, and you know, make clear um, for any authorities that um, have, have made that assumption, and I don't know that any have, but that those two things um, are complementary and, you know, not at conflict. I think you, you, your point is well made, but I think the reason why we're even having the discussion, um, rather than what's clearly the acceptance or common sense, flexible approach is the, is the position of the Scottish housing regulator. Am, am I right in saying that? And does, do we all agree that the guidance is the, the best way of, of providing the clarity that we need on this issue? I, th I think we've reached the point in development of housing options that guidance would be the right thing. Um, when we embarked on, on the process um, initially, around 2010, there was quite a strong sense. In fact, the very first event that was held in Edinburgh um, that brought all the different partners together to talk about housing options. It was very clearly um, expressed at that event that the last thing that local authorities needed was more uh, guidance, more regulation, more prescription about how they do their business. Um, what came out loud and clear was we want the freedom and the space to be able to develop these services. Bearing in mind that the homelessness services were still in place and are still intact, that hasn't changed. What we're doing here is developing an improved process that sits around the homelessness service. Um, but it's recognised now that, you know, two or three years in, as we've begun to develop things, that probably now is the right time to develop guidance. And we've actually got some guidance that we can put together that is coherent. We've also developed something of a, a, a national training framework which wouldn't have happened without those freedoms in the early period of housing options development. Um, and now is the right time to bring forth guidance that will just support some of those authorities that have maybe um, lagged a wee bit behind. Your organisation and COSLA are both uh, working um, to develop the guidance through the working group. Can you just give us very briefly uh, and finally a, a summation of where that work is at? Um, actually, the progress has been uh, very encouraging. We, we have um, mm. uh, quite a detailed draft already prepared. Um, we've got a further meeting later in October where it would be hoped um, we would finalise that draft. And certainly uh, the intention will be to present um, that working draft to the next uh, meeting of the Homelessness Prevention Steering Group. Um, and there'll be an opportunity there for um, a number of other stakeholders who have an interest to comment on it. In fact, there'll be an opportunity prior to that um, for some of those other stakeholders to comment on it. Um, it's quite a firm draft already and we're quite pleased with it and there's been a lot of consensus about how we built it. Um, so I'm very confident that it will meet all the requirements that the regulator set out and more. Um, and actually, I think for local authorities, it will be um, a really valuable resource for them in the future. Okay. So, yeah, please. That, that when it does come to the Homelessness Prevention Strategy Group, the test that I will apply when we're assessing the, the guidance is um, when do you know whether you've done your job? And if the guidance says that you've done your job when you've ticked a number of boxes, that won't do. If the guidance says that you've done your job when somebody has found settled accommodation, that's what we want. So it'll be very much about outcomes. And I think that's actually how Julie's been writing it and her colleagues. Okay, thank you. Alex, you've got a couple of questions. 
I do. I think we've covered some of the subjects. Uh, but if I could go very briefly, uh, we, we spoke, to, spoke about housing, housing options earlier, and we sort of skirted over the issue of gatekeeping. Now, without uh, mentioning any names, a number of stakeholders have uh, blamed some local authorities for using the housing options process as a, an opportunity to do a bit of gatekeeping. Uh, are there any examples of that, or do you have any response to that? Uh, I'll be brief. When I first heard about the housing options approach in Dundee, I was not in administration there, and uh, I was extremely suspicious and cynical about it. I thought that this just sounded like a way of um, avoiding our duties to homeless people. Um, I'm completely convinced that I was wrong, partly because we are now in administration, therefore it gives you a different perspective. Um, I think that it's actually a really good, innovative, imaginative approach, but it could be used as gatekeeping. And it may well be that in some offices of some local authorities that may have happened. And what we need to make sure is that it doesn't. And that's what all the good practice stuff and the guidelines and all the work that our group has been doing and um, our colleagues have been doing is aimed to prevent. Um, but that's also why we need people locally to scrutinise us. And, if that's a local MSP dealing with somebody at a surgery and um, not getting satisfaction from a local authority over a specific individual case, then I think I would certainly be interested to hear about it. I'm sure my colleagues would as well. So have, have we dodged that bullet or have we not dodged it yet? Uh, the bullets are always flying around <laughs> and um, it could easily happen because with the pressure on local authorities to meet targets and so on, um, it's always tempting, isn't it, to find an excuse to... To, to put somebody one way instead of another, in a marginal case, you might you might think. But um, it's really important that we do have the good practice guidelines and that we do follow them. And, uh, you know, we, we have our job to do. It's been laid down in statute. We have to do it. And I'm very keen, personally, that we do fulfil our responsibilities and obligations. And if anyone is gatekeeping, then we've got to stop that one way or another. And I think my colleagues would all agree with me. Absolutely, I would agree. <clears throat> what I would just also say is that um, prior to housing options, gatekeeping happened um, across the country in some instances and in some places. Um, I suppose, uh, despite you know a, a intensive support and training for people, there will always be um, you know somebody out there who didn't quite understand the instruction they were given. It's certainly not the intention of any local authority to gatekeep. Going back to the prevention guidance that I alluded to, there, there are some very clear statements in there that our intention in Scotland was to develop preventative services that were not about gatekeeping. And, and in our hub, hub, the West of Scotland hub, we have um, developed a, a joint protocol, a joint statement that says, what you know, alludes to our ethos, um, and one of the clear statements that are made in that protocol is that this is not about gatekeeping your services. This is about ensuring that you focus on the individual and you get the best outcome for them. Um, so it probably will happen and there'll be instances that will still occur. Um, however, I think um, at least we've got the opportunity through uh, the hubs, the regional um, joint work that's been done, the, the sharing of practice and the development of this really comprehensive training toolkit to ensure that we get to as many people out there that are delivering services as we can. It has to come from the top as well in local authorities. So we need to ensure that you know, senior managers get it um, and that that filters down through the whole organisation. Um, but, you know, I think um, we're... Nobody would suggest that it's never happened. I think what we would simply say is that that's nothing new that's been brought about because of housing options. Um, that was always a feature of the system that people would encounter. I think there was another scepticism about housing options uh, two, three years back, which was that the fear that, or the sense that... How can, how can you have a housing options approach when we know that most people don't have many options and but what was what we were being preoccupied there was thinking about people moving and i don't think we appreciated the extent to which a proportion of people uh, could be supported to 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 stay where they were with you know with the right support not everyone by no means everyone but i think we 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 all underestimated that that it, it, we all thought about well what you know what 
what options are there for people to move, private rented sector and not much else, you know, in some cases. Um, we, we did underestimate the extent to which it was possible to, to support people to, to stay where they were. When it comes to the delivery of the housing options approach, what role do RSLs have in that at the moment? And could they be doing more to participate in the delivery? It's obviously, housing options be began with, with, hope, with, with homelessness prevention and therefore was embedded in local authority practice. Um, I can only speak for, 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 for the Glasgow and West of Scotland area now, where there, there are real, real uh, 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 steps to roll that process out so that anyone applying for a house from a housing association and indeed in, uh, applying for a transfer in some cases can 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 have the benefit of that of that of that same approach and it really is uh, it really is uh, a case of, of doing something differently occasionally you you might hear i think a, again a year or two ago you might have heard one or two uh, of our members or, or SFHA's members saying, well, we kind of do it already. But I think what, what our members have realised is that it, it really is quite a different way of doing things, that that, that notion of spending an, up to an hour with somebody or more if need be, rather than 10 or 15 minutes, to look at the current situation, to look at, to look at the options, that really is happening. It needs... It's ha I think at its best it happens when there's a really well-coordinated approach, ultimately taking the lead from, from, from the local authority with all their experience of, of starting this process uh, a, a number of years back. Um, of training, there's, there's usually a significant amount of training needed for, ha for housing officers, for, for letting staff within associations. But the benefits, I mean, it is, it, there are challenges. You know, for a very small association to suddenly be spending that long uh, with people that they've only spent a few minutes with, that, that needs some realignment of, 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 of services. The benefits will be there, quite apart from the benefits for the individual. Probably a lot of associations are going to start finding that they don't get the same applicants coming back every month asking, asking about their, their application, which, quite frankly, in a lot of cases, probably isn't going very far uh, because they've been dealt with properly at the outset. So it, it really is a win-win situation, but not to underestimate some of the challenges for smaller landlords. Is it possible to assess the landscape across Scotland and see whether that is the experience or whether there are specific problems in some geographical areas? Um, the feedback we get is, is without exception, positive um, from both sides. When we're speaking to local authority colleagues, their relationships are fabulous on the ground right across Scotland. But I was thinking the other... The other um, uh, assistance that RSLs can give, of course, is they, they don't just provide social rented properties, they provide mid-market rent and, and full market rent too. So they can get involved in all sorts of different ways. And I know in Glasgow they've talked about setting up a local lettings agency through housing options and things like that. So there are many, many ways in which RSLs can get involved, but I think they fully embrace the concept, to be honest. Can I just add to that? Um, RSLs are now so diverse, so that they might well be involved in a local lettings initiative, but it could also be an employability project, or it could be any number of different kinds of voluntary activities which they, they get involved in now with what they used to call a wider role. So given that people's, people become homeless for many reasons, not just to do with the lack of a house, it may well be that by involving RSLs you can plug people into services which would otherwise not be available. Um, I mean, there's a project in Dundee called Making Money Work, which helps people get through those early stages of employment, you know, when you haven't been paid yet and you don't have any clothes and, uh, and does financial inclusion stuff and budget, budget work. You know, it may well be that actually RSLs bring more to the table than just their houses. And um, sure, in the early stages, I think there was a certain level of grumpiness between RSLs and local authorities because, you know, you'd refer someone to an RSL... Um, as homeless, and they would say, "Oh, we don't have any houses this week," and take them back. Well, you know that that's still going to happen because the housing market is complicated now. There are all these different providers, but um, it, it seems to be working much better. Um, and RSLs are cooperating well with local authorities, and local authorities maybe have a better understanding of what RSLs are able to provide. So, um, yeah, things are much better than they were. Thank you. Okay, um, Gordon. Convener. Um, in evidence to another committee, uh, the Legal Services Agency raised a concern about a crisis in provision of temporary accommodation in Glasgow. 
They say they have been advised this is because the Council is unable to obtain permanent accommodation from RSLs. And then they go on to say that while the local authority may have a duty, they do not have the wherewithal to meet the duty. So I'm keen, how well, I know what you've just said, uh, Councillor Black, about the relationship, but how well are local authorities and RSLs working together to ensure that permanent accommodation is available for homeless households, especially in places like Glasgow, where the council has no house in stock, and on a practical basis, how could that working relationship be improved? The duty is to provide settled accommodation. It's never been to provide settled accommodation in a council house. And I think there's been a certain level of misunderstanding about that over the years. But, I mean, there are people here from Glasgow who um, can give you the, the, the exact answer to your question. I, th I don't see a problem in, in, in it's not a relationship problem there at all. I think there's a willingness on the part of the housing association uh, sector in, in, in Glasgow to, to make its contribution. But, but you're right, stock transfer made things... Uh, much more complicated. You're talking obviously about one larger association and 40 to 50 smaller ones and that's a process that needs really quite intensive uh, management and coordination. You, do, you don't want to get to a situation where uh, you know, a, referral, a referral for instance goes to an association which may have 15 or 20 lets a year. Um, you've got to have the right um, uh, marriage if you like between uh, a referral and the stock and the turnover and the rate of turnover that a particular association has. And I think that that does need a, a lot of coordination. Now, what we've seen in Glasgow in the last year or two is, is, is uh, a really excellent coordination of the housing options approach. And I think that I think um, as long as we can get a similar um, uh, input of, of, of coordination, if you like, which, which has a resource implication, to uh, harnessing the, the, the stock of, of, of associations. And I think we'll see a fine tuning of the system that probably is needed just to make sure that stock can be, can, can be maximised. But if you think about it, it, it is complex. If you're an association that's got 15 lets a year, ideally you might, have a, you might want to come by a situation where if you have a void that, that, that day, that week, you want to, you want to in a sense, offer that uh, as a, as a, as, you know, so the, the initial impetus then comes from the housing association says, look, we've got a property. And I think for the system to be able to, to, to work both ways, uh, uh, um, so that a void-led system and a demand-led system that comes from the council, th these, these are complexities that, and, and a little bit of ironing out is needed, but certainly I, I don't, th there's no sense of a, of a relationship issue at all in Glasgow, but some fine-tuning, I'm sure, is needed, yeah. Okay. MDL, want to come on out? Um, I would just say in North Lanarkshire we've um, largely got around some of those sort of technical difficulties because we've got a common housing register and we've also now got a common allocation policy with our RSL partners and to put that into context of the 46,000 social rented houses in, that, in the area 80% are owned by the council and 20% by RSLs so we would never expect our colleagues in RSLs to pick up a an, an undue share of, of you know, people requiring housing. Um, but what we have been able to do is ensure that because we've got this commonality of approach, um, that we are prioritising people um, consistently. And that means that um, whoever has the vacancy when a person needs a house uh, offers that vacancy. And that's, you know, that's been a really, really um, beneficial um, outcome in terms of developing the CHR for the clients because they get you know they, they only need to go to one office to apply and speak to somebody about their options uh, rather than go around perhaps you know 15 different places. Within North Asia, there's a common housing register, a common allocation policy as well and what we have done is we have set the same targets across um, all social rented housing for homelessness, which means if we need to increase that target, the RSLs will increase their target at the same rate. If we decrease it, they decrease theirs at the same rate. So for homelessness, it works really well. But from a housing options, options perspective, it works really well also. And what we have is a lot of really good examples of joint working between the RSLs and the local authorities to try and find outcomes for specific individuals who may well be threatened by homelessness within two or three months without actually having to get as far as crisis. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, Adam. Okay, 
Okay, can, can I talk about uh, housing support duty um, and regulations? I understand there's just been some new revised guidance published um, very recently. Could I ask what impact has the housing support duty had on the provision of support for homeless households? And is there any scope for improved practice? Local authorities were already providing housing support before the duty was even discussed. Um, and I would say that the majority of local authorities are probably providing far higher levels of support than the duty actually directs us to, not only because we provide support to, unintent to, sorry, to intentionally homeless households, but also because we go f way above and beyond the support needs that are actually laid out within the guidelines. Um, yes, I think there is room for improvement. There are challenges that I think we've already discussed round about budgets, round about welfare reform and round, round about how we're going to continue to resource our services. However, we also recognise that there are opportunities that may well come from integration of health and social care, which will ensure that we've got integrated access to wider support provision. That's something that Councillor Black had mentioned right at the outset. Um, do you want to maybe add to that, uh, Councillor? The whole aspect of housing support, it doesn't appear to have dropped the bomb that some people predicted it would into the whole system. Um, I remember some fairly unexpected predictions of um, you know, whole teams of new staff have to be, having to be taken on. And I think that was always a misapprehension. Um, what it's made us do, I think, is understand our duties to homeless people better. And it's ensured that other bits of the council and other volunteer organisations locally who provide services um, get involved in a way they might not have got involved before. So it's not just the housing department's job anymore. It, it belongs to everyone. And I think that's absolutely crucial. In the same way as... Um, there's a doctor's surgery in Dundee just now which is able to provide an advice session at the Citizens Advice Bureau for their patients. Um, I think actually sometimes you have to prescribe something which maybe the housing department itself might not be able to provide. But there's a whole lot of things, and just practical things. It's fine to give somebody a house. Um, if there's no furniture in it and they don't have any way of getting any, then that's just no use to them at all. Um, and these kind of practices have gone on and maybe still do go on and we have to try and make sure that that, that is available to people, the, the furniture, um, the electricity, the power, the, the help that they need to actually live in a house and sustain that tenancy. And that support might be social or it might be practical. Um, it might be welfare benefits advice or it might be um, knowing you know, a mentor that can actually help you get through a specific situation. So people are different. Everyone's an individual. That's why the support duty is good and that's why the fact that you have to assess people's individual needs as good because there's more chance that you'll actually provide the service that they require. This is still early days, and I think the guidelines will help, the new guidance will help, um, and it's going to develop. And I think it all is very much bound up with the integration of health and social care. Um, if we get this right, then it'll make a huge difference. If we get it wrong, then it'll just be depressing. So I take it it's all part of the personalisation agenda as well, though. Janine had mentioned earlier about housing options being very much person-centred person approach. So in terms of people going through the housing options um, route, as opposed to the homeless route, would you, would you detect a, a difference between how, how people are, are, are supported? I think the assessment is slightly different because the statutory responsibility isn't there, but I think the assessment is still happening because that's part of the housing options approach. The housing options approach is it's about looking at more than just what the housing support duty says. It's about saying what is it this person requires, what are their needs entirely, not just what are their housing needs, and where gaps are recognised. So, for example, if someone, re someone um, requires assistance with budgeting, money management, debt issues, then referrals will be made to those agencies. If it's recognised that someone 
at the point of housing resettlement is going to require housing support, then that would be organised because it's not just about the housing outcome, it's about sustaining the housing outcome to ensure they don't become homeless again in the future. So yes, the um, assessment has been carried out and services are being provided, and that's something that we intend to pick up within the guidance to ensure that across the country there's the same approach to how we carry out that assessment. Okay, thank you. Jim? Jim? Sorry, did somebody... Oh, sorry, again. You said you mentioned that the housing support regulations are, you know, in many cases, being, being exceeded, but really the challenge that's already been uh, referenced and just to, to emphasise is the, the, the funding pressures uh, facing local government and public services generally and being able to sustain those services as everybody is absolutely committed to personalisation agenda, not just dealing with narrow housing solutions but providing full support and covering all aspects of support that uh, individuals and families require. Uh, but given the, the financial outlook uh, and the savings requirements, there's going to be a challenge in sustaining those services and protecting them, uh, because if, if that doesn't happen, the, the costs, both human and financial, will be much greater in the, the years to come. Yeah, I mean, I think we mentioned <coughs> um, keeping temporary accommodation stock, um, but the pressures on the housing stock in general still exist. I mean, David earlier said that you know the more person-centred approach um, was really important, and we just don't park people on waiting lists, but you know, in an ideal world, that person-centred approach would mean that waiting lists, people didn't stay so long on waiting lists, and waiting lists actually came down. But the pressure on housing stock means that you're not really making that impact on the on the waiting lists. Or it'll be interesting to see whether the rollout of the housing options approach across. Uh, housing lists, uh, 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 following on from rolling it out through, uh, 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 w with the homelessness system where it began, does have an impact because it may be that, what, that in a sense, it, you'd like to think that, that if lists in some places um, are full of people who f really realistically ha haven't a great chance of housing, that instead of, instead of them just in a sense sitting as a name on, on that list that, that a more proactive approach to looking at what what they can do ab about the housing situation um, may well take them off off that off that list um, uh, and and have their have their problems solved uh, elsewhere we've all got a reservation i think in in, in as national uh, housing and representative bodies we've we've all got a reservation when we use waiting list figures uh, because we all have a notion that, that the extent to which they, they uh, are a true representation of, of real acute housing need varies, literally from one case to another. So we all use those figures uh, nervously, but they're obviously a figure that, 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 that we do use. But in theory, housing options should have an impact on, on, on those lists. Not that it will, it will... What it will do is mean that what the people that are left on lists, that will be a truer representation of people in real, real housing need. And I think the shortfall will still be there for all to see. But if we can, if we can reduce it in terms of people that really have got to have an option somewhere else or in their current situation, that will help. So when do you think we might be in a situation to make that assessment I mean, how I can, it's working yeah i mean if i take glasgow as an example then we, with the rollout program for housing options is is you know is over a good a good uh, two years or so um it, it would be nice to think that it, within within that period we we may get a better sense of of, of the impact on on housing lists but that doesn't mean to say we, we take our, our eyes off the ball in terms of making as much new provision um, both in in, the, in social rented and in other in other intermediate tenures that we know we'll still we've still got to do that, um, but I'd, I'd like to think that in, in two to three years we might get and, and the same across local authorities that we might get a more realistic impression of levels of need within the housing list. And I mean, Julian, Janine, you, you were I mean, all local authorities I, I take it now are covered by a housing option hub and all RSLs, but obviously there are different stages, as you said, and you're going to try and roll out best practice. I mean, what kind of time scale are we talking about? Hopefully getting to a situation where everybody is really working to the best standard. Well, I think 
when I mentioned earlier that we feel as a group that we're probably at the best stage to develop guidance. I think that's on the basis that we now recognise that everybody at least has jumped on the train, um, but some are way at the back of the train still, and, and you know, the guidance will help to bring them up. Uh, it's difficult to, you know, to, to sort of cover all 32 local authorities. What I certainly do get a sense of when we go to the, the, the hub leads meetings, when we meet up... Um, in our, our sort of localised regional groups, I, I get a really strong sense of commitment, um, a really strong enthusiasm for it, a sense that people are saying, you know, my job is, is improved because of this, because actually I'm able to assist people in a way that I used to just feel as though I was just turning people away and saying no all the time. So all of those things in the development of training and the support for people that are delivering services... Um, you know, all moves us along in terms of um, starting to see improvements on the ground. In North Lanarkshire, for example, we do feel that we're starting to see improvements already, um, and, and it can be illustrated in our waiting lists. Our waiting lists have come down by around 2,000 um, over the period that we've been, you know, really sort of um, promoting housing options and serving, servicing um, people in that way. So... It's early days, and we wouldn't want to sort of put that out there and say this is a definite um, impact of housing options. But some of the signs are there that if you really implement it properly and support people to deliver it, um, because at the same time as we're seeing that reduction in our general waiting lists, we've also seen that a continuous reduction in homeless presentations. So those people... You know, the, the sense that those people are being gatekept and have to, you know, are getting lost somewhere else isn't really borne out in that case because they would pop up somewhere on the waiting list if that was the case. So I think it's early days and we wouldn't want to be too, um, you know, we wouldn't want to make claims that, could, that, that we couldn't substantiate. But I definitely think that we're on the way, on the right tra trajectory, which is positive. Um, Jim, is there anything that we haven't covered? Are you wash, pretty, washing pretty, up? <laughs> pretty much um, covered everything, uh, convener. Just on the housing options hubs, I'm just wondering if you felt that we were getting value for money for the Scottish Government's investment of just under a million pounds, and also whether you agree with the suggestion that they should be widened out to include housing associations and voluntary sector organisations. Well, their value for money. I think the economies of scale that we are um, managing to achieve by the joint working um, is considerable. And we're now in the position that we're not only working at local hub level, but we're also working at integrated hub level. So we're looking at not only trying to pool resources for four or five local authorities, but to take three hubs together and look at how we can do things like procure training programmes and um, produce materials to promote services. Um, so value for money, I would say yes. RSLs uh, be more involved in the hubs. Um, that journey has already begun um, in the West Hub. And I'll let uh, Julie speak to that because that's her hub. Um, they have Glasgow as one of their partners. Um, however, RSLs have become more involved, I would say, probably over the last year. We have consistently ensured that RSLs have been kept abreast as to what's happening in the hubs. But what we have now done is... Um, guaranteed that we would have at least one event annually that RSLs would be a part of. And as part of those events, we've identified key streams that RSLs want to be involved in. So that's doing things like ensuring if we're developing a core competency framework round about training, RSL partners have got access to that. Or if we're looking at how we develop our policies and procedures round about housing options, we're doing that in tandem with RSLs. So there'll be key focus pieces of work that we'll do in tandem with RSLs, both at a local and a national level. The hub that I sit in has two stock transfer authorities. That was a bit of a challenge for us because it was quite difficult for us to try and determine which RSLs would be best to sit round about the table with us. So what we have done is we have just invited everybody and the RSLs who want to be involved have become involved. Can I add something about the, the, the composition of the Homelessness Prevention Strategy Group? It includes the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations. It includes um, Shelter and the Homelessness Action. What, Has? What's that mean again? Oh. 
Thank you. It used to be called the Scottish Council for Single Homeless, and that's how I always knew it as, but Homelessness Action Scotland. So they provide that kind of consumer viewpoint. It also, um, and it has a producer viewpoint from the SFHA, and it has the local authorities, and it has the Minister for Housing. And um, so all of these things that we've talked about today are important to the group, and these are all the things that we're trying to drive forward. And we're trying to drive forward good practice. And um, we get reports of poor practice, and we try and deal with them. Um, not on an individual basis, we're not set up as a casework agency, but what we're trying to do is, is establish what's going wrong and, and, and sort it. And actually, it's been very good working together because um, we, we don't all represent the same interests, but I think we all want to achieve the same result, and uh, that's been fine. So in terms of spreading good practice, yes, we'll always do it, but convener, I don't think we'll ever get to the point where we should stop because um, good practice is something you have to keep topping up and you also learn. I think um, housing options in Mr Johnson's constituency is very different maybe from housing options in Mr McDonald's because um, the, the territory is very different and the options that are available are different, the landlords are different. Um, what we need to do is be imaginative about how we increase supply, building new houses absolutely, trying to match people up to the right houses absolutely. There is one of the good things a housing options advisor can do is a housing options advisor can help someone to be more realistic about their housing choices. And people will come to me as in my surgery and they'll say, I have to have a semi-detached house with a garden. And I say, this is Dundee, we have very few of those, and we have lots of two-bedroom flats, would you like one of those? And they say, no, we can't possibly have one of those. It won't work for us. And um, what we then have to do is have a discussion about why it won't work and and that's where housing options can come in, because somebody with the expertise that really knows the housing market, knows what's available in the city, can say, well, look, there's no point in holding out for that house with a garden, with um, gas cooking. Um, what you need to do is think about what you can find in a different area of the city or a different type of house that might actually do the same job for you. And you might be housed in six months instead of in five years. So, I mean, I think that that's what housing options can do. Um, it can prevent people getting to the point of crisis, and it can help them make help them understand the market in which they're operating, if you want to use that kind of word. I'm not sure if my colleagues would back me up on that at all, but uh, I hope so. Yeah, I would, I would always support what Councillor Black has to say on the matter, but I would also, in, in response to your query... Councillor Black, about what, sorry, can I just ask Councillor yes, Black specifically about the hubs and whether they, what impact and difference they're making? Well, you, you asked if they're value for money. Um, if you look at the cost of somebody becoming homeless and then having to be taken through all those processes and procedures and rehoused, that's phenomenally expensive. It doesn't take long to get your money back in the hubs. Um, the fact that people are not sitting in their own local authorities and sometimes in their own district offices, again, to use Mr Johnson's constituency or area of operation where I used to be involved myself as working for Nigel Don, um, different offices can have different practices. People can be isolated and um, things can be done the way they've I been. And that's what the, the hubs actually do. They bring people together, they spread the good practice out and um, they do it on a Scottish level, but they also do it on that kind of regional level and it gets out to all the local offices and that, that's what they're for. Um, I think it's really, really important to have that network of distribution of ideas and information and good practice. Because if we simply kind of um, discuss things at the Homelessness Prevention Strategy Group and make a proclamation, it won't actually ever reach the front desk where people are being interviewed. So, yeah, absolutely, I, th I think the hubs are very good value for money. I support them 100%. Thank you. Ms Hunter, you had a point. Uh, yes, simply um, that you talked also about voluntary organisations. Um, and although, as part of the sort of development process, RSLs are becoming much more linked to the hubs, Voluntary organisations are maybe still a wee bit further down the line. But that's not to say that at a local level we don't have partnerships that involve voluntary organisations. They're just, they're just at the end of the queue for getting really plugged into the housing options process. Any other members have any points? Okay, anyone else want to say something that they've wanted to say? Last chance. No. <laughs> For listening to us, um, it's always a pleasure to talk about housing. People don't always want to talk to you about that in the pub. Um, <laughs> it's 
not the most exciting <laughs> subject, but it's really important, and we appreciate the committee's taking the time to, to hear us today. No, that's been very, very useful to us um, in our inquiry, and um, our next our meeting next week is with the housing, the Minister for Housing and Welfare. So we'll take the opportunity to discuss with her many of the issues uh, which have been raised today. Can I apologise again for the interruption? It has led to the meeting being a bit bitty, but I hope you think that we've covered everything. And again, thanks very much. And I close the meeting, meeting next week, as I said, with the Minister, and we've got that meeting on Tuesday, uh, informal meeting on Tuesday morning. Close the meeting. Thank you very much.